It's Monday, the 6th of August, 2012, and in this Boardroom Talk special podcast, an unusual entrant in our studio today, John van der Rett, author of the Spud series, and uh, what has taken South Africa by storm since you, you wrote down uh, some ideas in a hotel room, as you say, in Harare 10 years ago. Life after Spud, I'd love to talk to you about that a little bit later, but John, at the time, did you have some kind of a business plan? Did you, uh, did you have a model for making money out of your schoolroom experiences? Uh, at, a, at the time, I was actually an, an actor, and um, actors have no idea about money, as you know. Um, and, and I started writing Spud with, with just my, my central, I suppose, tenets of the whole thing was, was this idea of legacy. So it, it wasn't a money project, and it certainly wasn't what I thought would, would make me a living. I mean, at the time, there was really no evidence of any books in South Africa locally pu- published going you know, through through the roof, and um, it it was at that stage it was a doodle, and then that doodle grew and grew, and it was really only in two thousand and six, once Spud had been on uh, selling for a couple of months, that I, I started to realise that this could change my life financially, and 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 obviously in in many other ways. It's four years then it took you from those first doodles. Yeah, it did. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, it, publishing takes a long time. I mean, Penguin said, yes, we're going to publish. And that was a good year before it actually came out. So 2002 to 2004 was the, the time of writing it. And then there was a sort of year hiatus while I waited for it to be published. And during that time, everyone was like, wow, well, you know, it's great that you published, but don't expect more than a few thousand copies. You know, you've heard all the stories, the uh, horror what stories. What was the first print? First print 4,000 copies. Yeah. And the first time I, I had a sense that it was – perhaps something was going to happen, was at the launch, uh, which was ironically at Hilton College, um, of all places, uh, as part of the Hilton Festival. And that night, I heard that Penguin had gone to reprint before the book had actually hit the shelves, I think based on on the uh, the stores, store uh, orders, and, and, and sort of word of mouth, uh, advanced word of mouth. Uh, and then they published another 2,000. So it wasn't as though they were thinking – Okay, let's go 10,000 now. It was 2,000. And then there was another sort of 4,000. And then the book uh, ran out at its first Christmas because, you know, nobody, this was unprecedented at the time. And um, and obviously I was just wild and kind of living the dream and just totally mesmerized by this idea. But even then people were saying, come February, there's always a big drop off. You know, it'll sell nicely for a few months. Don't get your hopes up. You know, this is perfect. You're doing so well. And it just kept going and going. And you know, you look at those lifetime sales of, of the first book, there wasn't an explosion. It just started steadily and it just maintained that 500, 550 books a week for, for nearly three years, which was just incredible. I'm sure you've read about uh, all these other success stories. Kiyosaki, for instance, no one would publish his book, so he had to print a 1,000 copies himself, sold it through a car wash, and then he ended up selling 17 million Is of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That, d- were you inspired by those stories, or, or did you go to Penguin and they said, yeah, we love it, we, we're going to take you on? Uh, I, it was a mixed bag. I mean, Penguin came back and, and immediately and said, we really like this and we're going to publish it. I mean, I still don't think in their heart of hearts they thought it, it was going to do anything like what it's done. Um, but I think quite often, you know, publishing houses, they 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 got to spend a lot of money on each book. So, you know, they they sort of naturally conservative about the way they go. And I've seen that in my international publishers. And and obviously it's it's that typical idea of the rich getting richer in terms of publishing. The more they spend on your book, the more they push your book, uh, the more your book is is really loved by by people at a publishing house directly equates to to the sales uh, and i can imagine a number of um authors everywhere um have sad stories about their books where they feel their book could have done so much better if it had the backing but it's a duality you you, you need the word of mouth to really sell the book to get the publisher to believe in it so it's 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 a tricky business and i mean look it, spud just struck gold it did feel like it was the gold rush and and ever since then it's just it's it's grown, it's grown, and it's 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 now at a stage where it's such a big operation. I mean, when I release this fourth book now, um, you know, I mean, the, the numbers that are being published and uh, what's the print run of this one? A hundred thousand on this one. So you, I mean, for South Africa, that's in, insane, and and I think sixty-seven thousand have been invoiced out to shops already. So I mean, it's just crazy numbers when you consider where I began. But um, but that's what happens with branding. And I mean, I've learned all these things actually by being on this journey. I don't think I was particularly uh, money savvy before that, and I still don't know if I'm 
quite what you'd call money savvy. But um, it's been fascinating to see this idea of a brand grow. And, and I used to be quite resistant to the idea of Spud being a brand because I wanted to hold on to the kind of creative side of it. But you've got to see it as a brand because that's the way it's sold and, and, and that's the way people buy it and people buy into that idea of, of a brand and what you're going to get from that brand and it's, it's quite fascinating for me. I remember buying a daughter of mine uh, one of your spud diaries so that gives you an indication of the leverage that there's been uh, for, for well, what you were saying. You took the brand, you then leveraged it further but I suppose the big thing must have been the movie. Yes. Or at least the first movie. Yes, because the movie, uh, you know, is an asset. My film rights are an asset, whereas my royalties, obviously, as you know, would be taxed as any other uh, uh, income would be. But um, my film rights actually become an asset, so they become even more valuable than the equivalent money and royalties to me. And and obviously now, being in, having control of four, uh, four possibly four movies. Uh, I mean, I've sold two now, and um, there's a lot of talk now from, from the team who wrapped up shooting yesterday in, in Cape Town on the second movie that um, that they hope to do three and four and possibly even what's never been done in South Africa is do them simultaneously, shoot in both. In Cape Town? We're talking yes. about Michael Hart yes, from I the know. Midlands. I know, I know. It's, um, it came down to money, of all things. Um, but, you know, having that 120-strong crew living in the Midlands, feeding them, transporting them up there, um, housing them in, in B&Bs, it's, it's, it's astronomical. I mean, you think about Cape Town, they all live at home. It, you know, it's, it's the ease of getting crew and, and, you know, something goes wrong, it's all there. It, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's chopped off a lot of the budget. So you've actually got the same quality film with the same cast, um, but you are chopping off a lot of the budget, and and I think that's that's a very good financial decision. I think also we shot Michael House to pieces in, in filming parlance. We we really did. I mean, there was it, it was hardly a, a brick wall that hadn't been shot with, you know, Spud walking a, you know, along or a bench where she wasn't on. And and I, I think it's in a way it's it's quite great that that we've. We explore that because I think there's a universal nature where people don't just go, this is a Michael House story. They go, this is our story. You know, this is a story of growing up. And we all remember characters from our school, those who went to boarding school, obviously even more so. But, um, you know, filming at Saks was, it's the oldest school in the country. And, and when you're inside there, you go, this isn't so different from Michael House. You know, it's, they're all of the same. So what about the characters, John? I ask this. I met a, a, a school colleague of yours. I think he was a couple of years behind you sorry, in front of you, and he remembers you well, he remembers the teachers well, but he felt that it was a combination in many instances of characters. I think that's correct. I, I, you know, I, I, I look at it like a poiki course. Uh, you know, there's, there's definitely truth in there. The truth are maybe the potatoes uh, to, to keep with the theme. But y you ultimately throw in bits and pieces, bits of myth. I mean, those kind of schools have a strong mythology. When you go there as a young boy, you tell these stories of ghosts and former old boys who did ridiculous things and a boy who got stuck in the, in the chapel window and a, a master who hanged himself in the chapel. And you have all these kind of folklore stories um, insane old boys who tried weird things in the 70s and 60s and and I suppose I've just thrown all that in to this part and, and when it comes to the characters yes there are some that are quite close to the boys I was with and I think anybody around my time would be able to say yes this is this character and that's that character and I, I think some of them have fun trying to identify it but at the same time you know I, I now only have sort of I suppose small visions of what they were like now. I can't remember exactly what they were like. So I, I fill them in with with what I do. You know, that's that fictional creative. And I, obviously I've, I subscribe to that idea that, the, you know, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. And I really do, you know, that's why I'm quite resistant to say it's autobiographical or I am spud or, you know, what have you. But having said that, there, there are things in, in the books and in the movie that, that happened to me verbatim. And... Um, and you matriculated in the same year yes. as, the, as the latest book. Yes, uh, yes. So, so I mean, it's it's a it, it is a, it is a. I quite often say that the tough things, the bad things that happened to Spud happened to me, and the great things, the beautiful girls, not so much. <laughs> Mr. Pike, did that happen to you as well? It did. Yes, I was I, I was sort of terrorized by one character in particular, and and he was he seemed to have it in for me, and I'm not sure why, but he. He, he he definitely had it in for me, and uh, there was some really nasty stuff that I felt, looking back now, I, I feel really went over the line of, of even bullying. It just sort of 
borderline stuff that you could probably get the police involved with. And and those are the tough things. You know, I think those are the tough things that when you look back at your school days, you sometimes gloss over those. And I think Spud's given me a chance, like, for example, having uh, Spud has his balls polished on his 14th birthday, which sounds quite funny. But when you see it played out in the movie, it's actually quite shocking because it's it's an invasion. And, and those kind of things happen to you. And obviously, as a boy, you roll with them and you kind of, you know, you remember the good times and so forth. But I think Spud's been able to give me the uh, give a, a correct balance of how I um, went through Michael House. And, uh, you know, there are many old boys who just go, oh, I loved it, loved it, loved it. Whereas for me, I had some wonderful moments, but I had some terrible moments. And it's it's almost quite a real experience for me in that way. It's um, I cathartic. Still, Yes, I think so. I, you know, I've had a chance to almost relive my youth by writing it out. Although I've, uh, you know, Spud, I think, is far more intelligent and, and more mature than I was, uh, you know, at the same age. But um, it's almost like a second youth. But and, and I think that's why I got quite sad and emotional towards the end of it. It was almost saying farewell to my second time around. And I, I, I think it's, it's, you know, it's time for me to move on and, and now start articulating in my adult life but it, it's been a phenomenal journey in that way to relive year by year that those crucial stages of growing up um, from from boy to manhood. J.K. Rowling has uh, I suppose not completely closed the book on the Harry Potter series have you now done that? I think so and actually be, you know so writing Spud while Harry Potter mania was was a flame because so many people would say, oh, it's, it's like South Africa's Harry Potter when it first came out at the time, which of course it isn't. But uh, I think they referred more to like the sort of sales and the sort of hype. But um, I, I really enjoyed the Harry Potter series. But I around about book four or five, I just started to f- fizzle out a bit. And I, I, I think, look, there are millions of fans who would tell me I'm ridiculous because, you know, they, they, they adore the series. But I started to think it was too long. Um, eight years to follow a boy's teenage years. Um, I, I kind of learned from that in a way. Adrian Mole too. Um, I loved his early diaries, but I don't like the ones when he's 50. And I wondered whether we needed to see him like that. And I'd rather Spud always be that schoolboy, the, the every boy in, in people's minds. And and as it was a legacy project, uh, a sense of just trying to get my, my little mark down in, in the history of something, um, I think I'll probably serve it better by ending when I'm on top rather than, oh, yes, fans want another one, so I'll write another one. Because I'm also aware that you'll write another one. Then they'll say, well, let's have another one. And, and you'll you'll never get to the end. So I, I do think in a way I almost preserve his, possibly his legacy, Spud's legacy, by ending it here and, and not going on and, and, and sort of using it as a cash cow for me, which which would be tempting because obviously it's, it's it's wonderful to feel this buzz and to feel so so prevalent in 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 the sort of country's writing landscape. So is, um, is it a cash cow? There are many writers plead poverty. Clearly, there are not many who sold half a million books just in this country. You you have to sell in the hundreds of thousands for it to to um, to make money. You know, obviously, it your your royalty. I think people often think of getting a, a percentage of what the the retail price is which isn't you you're getting a percentage of what your publisher sells spud for in my case spud for uh, to to say exclusive books now the price may be 120 rand in the shops but penguin are selling it to exclusive books say at 55 rand a book so now i'm getting my percentage of that 55 rand so is that the normal 60 that, and a half or can you negotiate no i well, I, I have i have obviously negotiated and, and what i did early and it was actually a very good idea is that i i negotiated a, a sort of what you would say is sort of fairly common or average um, royalty. But then once it got past 10,000 and then 50,000, it escalated on both counts. So I basically smart. I said to Penguin, well, let's share. If it goes big, let's let's share mm-hmm. that. Uh, I, I, I wonder if they look back now and say, well, maybe we shouldn't have done that. But certainly I think that was one of the sort of cle- clever. Where did you get that from? Well, you know, I, I started to believe that this was going to go big. Um, and, and I had this... I just had this, particularly when people who read it and just said, oh, you know, I rolled around on the carpet laughing. And, and there aren't many books that did that. I started, I, I suppose I just threw it out there originally. And you could say it was hubris or arrogance that, that I thought it would go, go quite big. But I had a feeling that something might happen. And I had a bit of a profile from my theater 
uh, sort of touring and so forth. So, you know, look, call, call it the sort of arrogance of youth. But um, and obviously, then when I've we've renegotiated deal, I've, I've my you know you do escalate up because you're in a, a stronger bargaining position. Um, but getting back to that, yes, you you can't really make money here in South Africa even if you sell 20,000. Because you have to consider, too, it's not just the money you're making then. You, you, you're paying for the two years it's taken to write the novel. So, you know, also what happens, you get your royalties in a huge big clump. You know, they're, they're, if there's, you know, massive sales over sort of, say, four months, so like I will probably have now heading from here to Christmas, um, I'll get a, a big lump sum in, in, my, um, in my April royalties. And... Um, and then obviously the tax man takes a big chunk of that, so so it's 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 less easy, and um, and certainly I, I although I live comfortably at the moment, it's not something I take for granted that Spud's going to set me up for life. The movies are actually very good for me in terms of getting a big bulk sum in. That's like a dream, isn't it? You create a character, you build it, and then you you make money clearly off the books as I make a living off the books, but then if it really hits big. The movies give the the upside. Well, that is that that is. I mean, it's. I couldn't have asked for it to be. You know, to, to run any other way. It is perfect. Um, you know, it obviously takes it takes the success to make people think that it could be a successful movie. But I think the true joy about earning money from royalties. I, you know, I mean, I think there's many people out there in businesses and scrap metal who are going to earn way more money than I ever will. But the glorious thing is that you you get paid whether you're on holiday, whether you are not writing wherever you are you get those royalty checks as long as your books are selling you know and and it's the freedom and the time you actually buy your life back as an artist or a creative person you buy your life back you you are able to operate on your own terms and create in your own terms and i, I think quite often in south africa there are very few writers who don't have a day job who aren't lecturing or teaching or or whatever it may be and i think it must be very difficult to get home at five six in the evening and then start writing. How do you incentivize yourself? I, I ask this. I, I spoke to Wilbur Smith after his latest book, and he said that it took him eight months of extremely disciplined writing, and then he knew, though, at the end of it, he had two years off to go and shoot in uh, Iceland and trout fishing, and uh, uh, I think it was in Sweden that he was going, etc. Do you do the same kind of thing? Well, Wilbur obviously owns islands and so forth. Uh, uh, I'm a very mini Wilbur, but um, I, I try and do similar things. For example, I, I tr I've really made a conscious effort to try and live the life of, a, of, a, of an author, of a successful author in the last few years, knowing that this might just be a transient moment in my life. Um, and, it, you know, for example, when I'm finished the first draft, my girlfriend and I, we set off for the East for a five-week holiday. So when my editor's uh, editing my book and kind of, you know, tightening things up, I'm away on a holiday. Then I come back and I'm refreshed and I nail it again. And, you know, it's things like that. Yes, you can do those things because time is yours and you've got the money to do it. So it's a hugely privileged and, and wonderful position to be in. And, um, you know, it, it's still not enough for me to say, uh, I want to write spuds for the rest of my life because creatively I feel that's that's where I've got to go. And if, you know, if I feel that, that the best is yet to come and I hope the best is yet to come and that spuds just the start, um, then then I need to put myself out there again and feel that sense of risk that I've got to write something here to keep my world going as, 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 I, as I understand it. So there is life after spud? Yes, there is. I, I don't know what it is. I'm, I'm certainly going to dabble for a year. And when I say dabble, it might be a bit of theater. It's, uh, you know, possibly a screenplay, a play. Um, I, I, I'm not going to rush that next book. I'm very aware that the next book is probably going to be my most important book because it's that moment where all these Spud fans are going to have a look at that and going to say, do we follow this guy? Did, you know, are these fans that are just Spud fans or are these John van der Rey writing fans who will follow me in whatever I write? And I don't think you can take that for granted that they necessarily will. I think many people, despite whatever I write, will go, oh, Spud is still my favorite. I wish you'd write another Spud. So I think I'm going to have to be strong to resist that, particularly if what I write next doesn't meet with that same success. I mean, the other alternative is, 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 is obviously international, and that's where I'd like to push next because that's the next frontier for me. I know it's, it, it may sound a bit blasé, but, I, but to keep writing just for a South African market only – feels to me like a little limiting and I would love to take them along and to try and sort of really open up um, 
I suppose, new fan bases around the world. I have, you know, avid Spud fans all over the world, but I think being a South African story, it's very hard to sell a story based and, and sort of grounded in South Africa internationally. How has it traveled with the books and well, the movie? Well, you know what? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mixed bag because if I said to you, well, the book's done 30, uh, Spud 1 sold 35,000 copies in America, you'd probably be very impressed. But they printed 60,000, so they go, well, it didn't do as well as we thought. Um, it's had very, and disappointingly so, very little response from Penguin UK, who I think that I, I fell into that classic trap where I it's, it felt so good to sign my world rights over to Penguin UK. But then you realize that if there's nobody there who adores the book and fights for the book and pushes the book, um, it was strange. I had this great review in The Guardian in London that, that said Spud was superior to Adrian Mull in, in every way, which, which I thought, wow, here we go. I mean, if even the Brits are saying this, I mean, I, I was quite astonished by that. But ironically, nothing came of that. I, I, I was never contacted by anyone at Penguin UK. I never went over and did publicity. I didn't do a shred of publicity. And I ended up selling sort of ten to 12,000 there, which is pretty good. It wasn't stocked in shops. It was just on Amazon. But it feels like it hasn't been pushed. There wasn't a single advert in a South African paper. I mean, if you think about how you would go about selling to, to those expats for one, none of that was done. And that's the frustration and impotence you feel almost as an author uh, here in South Africa when your book is purchased. And it's quite similar with Spud the Movie. Um, a big company, say Universal um, UK, will buy the movie. And you think, wow, this is it. You've got a huge big entity behind you. But actually, they're just trying to make money out of it. So... It may not be in their best interest to actually do a big cinema release. They sell it to Sky TV for a big whack of a profit, and they've made their money, and that's what they bought it for. So it's, it's you know, I think people often think if you have big success here, it's only right that you have big success there. But it still seems astonishing to me that a book um, that will, a series that probably would have sold close to 600,000 copies by Christmas here um, has not been pushed at all in, in um in the UK, and it feels like a, for me still, a, a huge, hugely missed opportunity. But maybe an opportunity for you. If you recall, one of Gladwell's books, he spoke about the author of the Yah Yah Girls or the Yah Yah Club, yes. who went around to book clubs and so on. I, I, I guess that's not in your future, but uh, there's always an opportunity. Well, there, there. there's an opportunity now because um, the, the movie is going to be released in the UK, and there's going to be a big DVD uh, run at Christmas, and then the Sky TV. I think are going to run it next year. And now, for me, as a as a as a uh, writer and the author. That Sky TV deal actually is, is brilliant because it's going to probably play to millions on TV, which is far more beneficial to me than a sort of limited cinema run, etc. So I'm hoping that um, Penguin UK will, will see, the, see the light with John Cleese, etc., etc., and say, well, let's give this a little push because I feel that's all it needs. I feel I need to get over there and sell it myself too and as be, in, be in there doing my talks you know, spreading the word. You need to do that. You can't hope that it's just going to be sold by some marketing department overseas. Well, you deserve all the success that you will inevitably get there. Uh, just as far as marketing is concerned in this, in this new age, you are 37. I couldn't believe it, uh, know, John. You know, know. Getting on now. <laughs> too, you're too old to be writing <laughs> adolescent books, I think. But, but you, you're pretty sussed on social media. Have you been using that to market? Yes. And I mean, that's a great example of the difference between 2009 when I released Learning to Fly, the third book, and now this book. Suddenly we have, you know, this this force. You know, I've got 20,000 on my Facebook page and um, Twitter I've got into recently, but that's growing nicely too. And I really enjoy Twitter. I, f I find that suits my style better than Facebook, which is more sort of revelatory about, you know, your personal sort of life. And um, it is, it, it feels like it's easier to sell the book now with the social media. It really is. Um, before you'd rely on that, the, the booksellers and the word of mouth. And and I think social media has changed the way we, we, we read and it's changed the, the sort of the notion of how we read. And I think that's a whole fascinating subject on its own. But Would you consider self-publishing given... Uh, the the experimenting that you're doing with social media. You know what I, I I've I can only speak highly highly of Penguin South Africa. So you know, I think possibly, possibly. You know, you you if you think about it, you you could be earning four times per book um, if you self-publish. Uh, and the the problem with self-publishing is that you don't have 
the links into the booksellers. You don't have that sort of army of people behind you selling and pushing what you do get from a publisher or a publisher at least that's pushing your book. Um, but who knows in the future? I, I, I certainly think our spud has been a bit of a trailblazer here. And um, I, I'm not too sure where where and how the next sort of book's going to come out. Um, I've, you know, this, I've had a wonderful sort of uh, re relationship with Penguin South Africa. But I, I also am very aware that international reach is important to me. And if I feel that the Penguin Group isn't the way that I'm going to reach there on my experience of SPUD, then perhaps I, I will look elsewhere. But I mean, that's still up in the air. I, I, I think it'll be a good year before I start writing whatever that next novel is for well, me. And, and so it should be. You have a good rest to reward yourself like Wilbur Smith does. But could you give us an indication of the sales that have been through e-books uh, relative to hard copies? Well, that's, that's another huge problem is that Penguin Global are tied up in a huge legal problem. So there are no South... The South African e-book version of Spud has been waiting to go for close to two years now and still wrapped in a, in a, in a legal wrangle. And I was thinking, well, surely they're going to have it done by now. So I released Spud 4 and I could be releasing to the world and Penguin South Africa could be making a fortune. But it's another frustration with the Penguin Global brand that I've, I've been experiencing. So, so you know, all these things are now as I get into sort of negotiation phases with it. Um, and, and obviously it's quite tough because Penguin South Africa don't always have a say on this. And quite often it's people in London who make these calls. Um, so I, I, there has been some frustration with the international reach. And I do believe that, that, that there's tremendous possibilities for ju judging by the amounts of people who have, you know, got back to me uh, fans all over the world that people are like when is it going to release in England or when's the next one going to release in America and I can only go I'm sorry that's 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 not up to me you know I wish it was but it's not, uh, it's, it's not a, uh, an issue that a writer should have to deal with no and I don't think when you sell half a million copies in one of the smallest book industries in the world uh, that you should be confronted with that but there is that kind of reverse colonialism thing whether we like it or not that they expect us to sell their books, you know, your Marion Keyses and your Jamie Olivers. But when it goes the other way, there's not really a, there's no premise for that. They almost don't have that facility to, to understand that a book from a small, a small backwater like South Africa could um, take England by storm and the UK by storm. So it's it's also a, it's a at times a lack of vision, I think. But you know that's that's what makes it so tough being in South Africa and trying to sell whether it be film or music or books that you can have huge success here, but you can meet with many brick walls out there. John, just to close off with, Spud comes from a very poor background, modest background. Is that yours as well? Um, not as such. Uh, well, my folks are what I'd say good old middle class South African stock and um, certainly no heirs and graces. And I, I think where I found that is they were very different to the sort of Michael House parents because my folks were like the, you know, arrive and crack open the, the bottles of wine and have a bury roll and you know the squattle bri comes out so that's accurate that's very accurate but it's also just their down to earth nature so what i did then is is heighten that difference and obviously it's even you know comedically it really worked for them to be arriving in the shot out station wagon and for that difference that marked difference between the sort of elitism of of many of the boys there coming from very wealthy families and spud coming from a very sort of lower middle class family um that difference has been heightened but i think what what existed was a sense almost a sort of a cultural difference between where i was and where many of the boys were you know many of them were very wealthy joburg uh, northern suburbs boys and and I came from Lower Durban North, a sort of normal, regular house. In fact, they shot the house they shot the movie in was, was less than a kilometre from my, my own house where I grew up in. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it's like everything, I, you know, a little bit of exaggeration and embellishment, but the seed of truth uh, lies in the middle. John van der Reet, author of the Spud series.